Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today in Utah, Northrop Grumman were testing the first stage of their new uh, Omega rocket when this happened. The nozzle essentially disintegrated right at the very end of the two minute long test. This is a solid rocket booster, so there's no way to turn the engine off or anything. Once this is lit, it will burn until depletion. So. Yeah, obviously in slow motion you can see that nozzle letting go like that. If you zoom in a little more, yeah, you can see it kind of, the explosion literally tears the thing apart and those are fragments of the nozzle. And we can fade back and forth between the before and after shots from a couple of cameras just to get an idea of how much is missing on this thing. And when you play the video, it's a bit more obvious where the, you know, where the nozzle has essentially gone missing. Now, if you think this test setup looks familiar, it probably is because it was used to test the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle, and this is a test of a booster for the uh, SLS. And the great thing is here we can actually watch the test complete successfully. You can see the thing burn out, and then what happens is they want to then extinguish the fire. So there's this robot arm thing that actually comes out, and you see it turning around. It's then going to extend inside and start spraying, I guess they start spraying water, maybe it's something else, but they're essentially trying to put out a fire in there so that the crews can get in there as quickly as possible and examine the material and see what it looks like in a post-burn status. So with that in mind, let's go back to today's test. So this is a Castor 600, which is very closely related to the booster used on the SLS and the Space Shuttle. It's shorter, it's the same diameter, but the casing on this uses modern you know, composite materials, whereas the casings on the Space Shuttle and SLS boosters still use steel. The fuel in both of these is aluminium powder and ammonium perchlorate as an oxidizer, and this is bound together with a plastic material, but in the older Space Shuttle boosters, the binder is polybutadiene acrylonitrile, whereas in the modern Castor engines, they're using something called hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene. In both cases, the boosters are not simple, dumb pieces of hardware. They actually have hydraulics, sensors. The nozzles, importantly, are able to perform thrust vectoring, therefore they can control this. And this is going to be essential because this is going to be the first stage of a rocket. It has to be able to perform these thrust you know, vectoring so that it can keep the spacecraft under control. On the space shuttle, the thrust vectoring was also essential on those boosters because, again, it was where most of the thrust was coming from and they needed that to steer it. If they lost no, if they lost like a nozzle vectoring control on the space shuttle, that would be a failure condition that would probably result in the loss of the crew in the vehicle. And so the importance of this thrust vectoring is important, and that means that if you had the nozzle get damaged, you would likely lose the ability to steer the rocket. Therefore, when this happened, it didn't look like a catastrophic failure, but it would very likely lead to the rocket going off course and therefore the flight termination system having to be triggered. However, this did actually happen right towards the end of the burn, so it's entirely possible the thing just might have continued in a straight line for long enough that they could have staged and fired the second stage. But of course, this is why you test, right? Literally, this is why you test. Things explode and you learn that the hardware you've built is not up to the task. As for why this happened, well, I mean, it could simply be a defect on the nozzle that led to it breaking under the strain, or it could equally be a defect in the fuel. So this is solid rocket motor, that means the fuel is placed, it's poured into it, it's kind of like a rubber and it sets hard. But as it burns, chunks fall off and then get blown out through the back of the nozzle. It's entirely possible that they've scaled this up to a new, you know, larger motor compared to what they've previously used on. And this is now they're discovering that their manufacturing process leads to voids or weaknesses. And maybe a chunk flew through the nozzle and caused the thing to break. The official word from Northrop Grumman at the post-test uh, press conference was that the test was essentially a success, that it was uh, the engine performed nominally with the exception of an observation at the end of the test, which I guess is what you say when the word anomaly is too specific. 
One thing that was asked by the press was whether this might affect SLS because, of course, they are derived from largely the same hardware. Is there something in the nozzle that might be common that should be investigated? They tried to play that down, but the best they could say was that the nozzle in this case was more commercial, which is, again, pretty non-specific. Anyway, you may not have heard about the Omega, but is it is the brainchild of Orbital ATK before they were acquired by Northrop Grumman. It is a rocket built from all those different individual solid rocket motors that they sell, bolted together, and then they have a, an upper stage, which is using RL-10s and hydrogen-oxygen propulsion. Earlier this year, they got about $800 million from the Air Force to develop this into a working launch vehicle. And I can see why the Air Force backed it. It's using a lot of existing hardware or hardware with known good heritage. Uh, they'll, I guess the biggest unknown for is this upper stage, which, you know, is pretty much a copy of the upper stage used on the Delta. So yeah, you've got the core Castor engines. There's a Castor 600, then a 300 stacked on top of it. And then there's these gem motors on the side. These are the same kind of engines used on the Vulcan. This version is able to put something like seven tons into low Earth orbit. There is a heavy version that replaces the first stage with one that is twice as long. It's a Castor 1200 instead of a 600. And that means the first stage is a lot more like the full-sized solid boosters used on the space shuttle. Depending upon the payload, they can adjust the number of boosters, strap-on boosters used on the first stage. Now, as I said, it says Northrop Grumman, but they acquired Orbital ATK, who had been working on this. So Orbital ATK was made of two different companies. It was made of Alliance Tech Systems and Orbital Sciences Corporation. And they actually already had their own uh, rockets. They had... Um, the Antares launch vehicle, which is currently used to launch the Cygnus cargo spacecraft to the space station. And they have the Pegasus, which is, of course, the air-launched rocket that can carry uh, small payloads into space. It's actually kind of interesting that the Antares is sort of the reverse of the Omega, in that the first stage on the Antares is a liquid-fueled stage, and then the upper stage is a solid rocket motor, whereas, of course, Omega has it the other way around. It has the first stage as being solids, and then the final stage is a liquid-fueled engine. The base version of the Omega should get performance roughly equivalent to the Antares, putting about 5 to 7 tons into low Earth orbit, whereas the heavier version with the 1200 should be able to put, you know, 5 tons into geostationary orbit. So it is a totally viable launch vehicle from a well-known company that is using hardware that has been tested. And they've got a pretty aggressive development schedule planned out. They said that when they originally pitched this, that they were going to be testing in May 2019, and they got their test in May 2019, even if it didn't work quite as they expected. And I'm going to say it doesn't seem like a particularly interesting rocket to many of you, but solid rocket motors are pretty spectacularly bright, so I'm looking forward to seeing it launching out of Vandenberg at some point. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. 